So I'm Dr. Diana Lee. I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training Initiatives here at Columbia University Zuckerman Institute. And it's really a delight for me to welcome you all to tonight's event, uh, the Stavros Narcos Foundation of Brain Insight Lecture Series for our final lecture of this year entitled uh, Memory as Narrative Power. And this series spotlights world-class researchers at the top of their field addressing important scientific issues about the brain and mind that touch our day to day. And so we hope tonight's event will give you a really unique view into their work and leave you inspired by the research taking place at Columbia University. So with generous support from the Stavros Narcos Foundation, Columbia's Zuckerman Institute continues our commitment to foster exceptional science and outstanding programming uh, and that highlights the ways that neuroscience can intersect with our lives. And this lecture series um, is really special because it's paired closely with another one of our programs, the Stavros Narcos Foundation Teacher Scholar Program, which engages a cohort of two dozen secondary school teachers who bring this content into their classrooms across New York City. So we're really grateful to be able to continue welcoming our local teacher scholars um, and their students in person to this lecture series. And so we're also really thrilled to have so many of you tuning in online from around the country and around the world. So as I mentioned, tonight's lecture is the final one for our 2023 and 2024 season. And just like thinking back on the year, like putting together this series, I think is one of the most rewarding parts of my job because it allows us to create a space to bring together researchers across many different departments and across the whole university to explore their work from new and interesting perspectives. So if you've been with us for every lecture so far this year, I'm really amazed. Um, you have my admiration and definitely my gratitude. And in particular, I wanna thank the Stavros Narcos Foundation members who have joined our audiences throughout this year. And I wanna give a special shout out to Casey and John from the foundation for coming all the way in person, as well as our board member, Ken, from the Brain Trust for your presence in our audience as well. So just having you all here, really underscores the support we feel in this partnership to make brain science accessible, enjoyable, and fun for all. So for those of you who might be tuning in for the first time with us tonight, I wanna really welcome you and I hope you have a lot of fun um, exploring this topic on the neuroscience behind memory with us and think about how it creates meaning for the narratives that help us understand not just who we are, but also the stories that we tell each other. So memory can be, I don't know, kind of like vast and daunting. You know, we might wonder how the brain organizes memories into events and shapes these stories that we tell. And we might also wonder how that changes throughout our lives, what happens when we age. But I also like to think that, you know, as vast as memory is, it includes the space for hope and growth. So, you know, what are things we can do now to maintain a healthy mind just across our lives? So tonight our experts are the perfect people to try to answer these questions. And they bring perspectives across um, many different scopes from cellular to cognitive and clinical approaches. And we're gonna be treated to presentations from two incredible speakers followed by a conversation between them, led by Columbia University's own Dr. Julie Prado. So she's our host for today's event. And Dr. Prado is a neuroscientist and postdoctoral scientist at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She completed her degree um, in undergrad at Drew University in biology and economics and earned her master's of science in biology on the molecular track from Long Island University. She then went on to receive her PhD from SUNY Downstate in Neural and Behavioral Studies, where she uh, studied synaptic pruning during puberty. And her research now at Columbia University focuses on the role of the microtubule cytoskeleton as a driver of synapse loss and other disease pathologies in Alzheimer's disease. Her research interests continue to focus on synaptic pruning and exploring the role of the cytoskeleton, which is a key structure that helps cells maintain their shape and perform um, well in maintaining synapses. 
Additionally, she's been working on a project to develop an open source software for counting dendritic spines in neurons. She has received fellowships from the Alzheimer's Association and the Italian Academy, as well as awards for her teaching and mentoring. So for those of you watching online, I encourage you to use the Q&A function and as you're listening to all of these events uh, unfold today, and that button's at the bottom of your screen, so you can submit questions and Julie will be keeping track of those to pick great questions for our moder uh, moderated Q&A. And if you are in person, there will be a chance uh, for her to invite you to raise your hand and ask your question into a microphone so we can all hear your questions. So please put your hands together to join me in giving a very warm welcome to our host and moderator, Julie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for your kind introduction. It's my pleasure to introduce this event. Uh, in today's event, we'll be hearing from Dr. Chris Baldassano and Dr. Jennifer Manley, two experts in the field of memory research. Memory is a topic in neuroscience that is very exciting to me. Um, memories, in some way, are who we are. Uh, but they're also a biological process, and it has been exciting to watch the field explore the mechanisms that underlie memory, whether at a single synapse, where information is transmitted between two brain cells, or looking at a network of brain cells firing together or observing activity in specific brain regions. I am a cellular molecular neuroscientist in the lab of Dr. Francesca Bartolini, and we are studying if we can prevent some of the not so nice changes that we see in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. We measure a successful treatment by a number of methods, by looking at protein levels, by looking at the number of connections between neurons, but we also evaluate memory we are using rodent models to do this. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how mice and rats remember things. Uh, but tonight, we will be focusing on memory in humans, in particular, looking at how our brain organizes information so that way we can remember things, as well as what happens when we have a disease that, are effects, that affects our memory, like Alzheimer's disease, and specifically how life experiences can play a protective or harmful role. So in this event, we will hear two 15-minute talks, one from each speaker, and then I will moderate a discussion in which we will include questions from you, our audience. Uh, if you have already submitted a question, thank you. If you wish to submit a question while the talks are in progress, please look for the Q&A button to submit your questions to the panelists. And please do let us know if you're a teacher or student. Uh, we love to hear from you. And we're all mentors here, and we especially love questions from curious students. And let us know what grade you're in, too. We want to hear from you. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Chris Baldassano, and who is, a, uh, who is a psychologist studying the neural processes that underlie memory. Dr. Baldassano is an assistant professor in the psychology department at Columbia University. He was an undergraduate in electrical engineering at Princeton University received his PhD in computer science at Stanford University, and was a postdoctoral scholar at the Princeton Neuroscience Institute. His lab's research focuses on how knowledge about the world, including semantic knowledge, temporal structure, spatial maps, or schematic scripts, is used to understand and remember complex naturalistic experiences. By applying machine learning, to technique, uh, by applying machine learning techniques to data from behavioral neuroimaging experiments, Dr. Baldassano's work aims to uncover how dynamic representations in the mind and brain during perception lead to the formation of event memories. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Baldassano to the stage. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I'm here, I'm very excited to be here today to tell you about some of the research that my lab has done, thinking about how we build memories in the brain. And so this idea of building a memory might sound a little bit strange. I think we usually think about memory as basically being a recording of things that happen to us. Uh, but what we've actually known in cognitive psychology for a long time is that our memories are not just about what's happening in the world, that coming in through our senses, but they have a lot to do with what we know and what we believe about the world. So, uh, for example, in some classic studies in the 70s, um, they had people read stories like this. 
Rocky slowly got up from the mat planning his, planning his escape. Um, and so when reading a story like this, they'd ask people later about their memory for the story. And most people would say something like, um, I read a story about this person who was, uh, was upset because he was arrested on a, on a weak charge. Um, but it, for people that were wrestling fans, they actually remembered the story very differently. They thought this was a story about someone trying to escape a headlock. And so this, the memories that we have are colored not only by our experiences, but also this kind of internal knowledge that we have about the world and all of these assumptions that we're making about the things that we see. So this kind of knowledge that we have about how we think events are going to unfold in the world, this is called uh, event schemas, schematic knowledge. And a specific type of schema that my lab is really interested in uh, is what's called event scripts, which is our knowledge about how events tend to unfold in the world. So for example, uh, if you've eaten at a restaurant many times, um, I could ask you about what usually happens at a sit-down restaurant with a sequence of events is, um, and you have a pretty good idea of roughly here are the kind of things that are going to happen in the future. Um, and this kind of knowledge about the world is really important for things like just understanding what's going on, making predictions, making connections. Um, you know, for example, if you're reading a story uh, saying John was feeling hungry as he seated himself at a table, he saw the waiter approaching but suddenly realized he'd forgotten his reading glasses. Um, understanding what is going on with the glasses here, right? Why would someone, why might you need your glasses in order to order, uh, to order food at a restaurant, um, right? This is based on our knowledge about what happens at restaurants that we can make the inference, right? That he's struggling to read the menu. So um, again, this is a classic idea in cognitive psychology that we use this kind of knowledge about the world to help structure our memories. And what I've been trying to do in my lab is to help understand how this information is represented in the brain. So how do we activate this kind of internal knowledge? And what are the consequences of, uh, of having this knowledge on the memories that we form? So in a first study uh, looking at this, what we did is we showed people a bunch of stories that took place either at restaurants or airports. So each of these stories went through the same kind of sequence of schematic events. So all of the airport stories, for example, uh, involve someone going through this very standardized sequence of going into the airport, going through security, checking in and getting on the plane. Uh, but what we tried to do is make the stories as different as possible in every other way. So some of these were video clips that we showed people. Some of them are audiobook stories. Uh, the characters are different in each of these stories. Some are kind of funny, some are like thrillers. And so um, the idea here is that these are, this is a very varied set of narratives, but they do all share this kind of, uh, this, this hidden kind of semantic structure, right, that our brains are very sensitive to. Uh, so, for example, two of the airport stories here, this is from the movie Night and Day, um, and so we have the, the characters sort of meeting here as they're coming into the airport, uh, going through security, rushing to the boarding gate and getting on the plane. Uh, here's another one of these clips, this is from the movie Due Date, that again depicts this kind of airport sequence of the characters coming in the airport, going through security, uh, checking in and getting on the plane, although again, uh, there's many differences between these two kinds of clips. And so what we're interested in is, are there brain regions that think these two kinds of, of movies share some kind of similarity? They share some kind of structure over time, even though on the surface the details of what's going on are quite different. So the main way that my lab measures brain activity is we use functional MRI. Uh, so we use these machines, there's two of them downstairs in this building that we use. Uh, so we put people into these machines, we can show them movies, we can play them sound while they're in there. Uh, and what we get out is this sort of fuzzy picture of neural activity throughout the brain. So we're getting a rough measure of how much neurons are firing in every part of the brain. We're getting a snapshot every couple seconds of what's going on. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk specifically about a part of the brain that we think is really important for tracking this kind of abstract structure in our experiences. Uh, this is called the medial prefrontal cortex. So that name medial prefrontal just means this is the middle part of the brain. Here I'm showing a picture of a brain where we've like sliced it in half uh, and we're interested in the front part of the brain. So this is the part of your brain that's right behind your eyes and behind your forehead. So what we can do is we can look at while people are watching the beginning part of this video, um, we can look at what's going on in their medial prefrontal cortex. Um, what I'm showing you there is a, a picture of activity in this part of the brain, and so more reddish regions, these are regions where lots of neurons are firing, and blue ones are where the, the neurons are firing less. Uh, so we can measure this activity throughout one of these clips. We can look at the pattern of brain activity that, that goes on. Um, you can see it looks pretty different from clip to clip, so as you're watching this movie, activity in your brain is changing over time. And then we can compare this activity to a, a different one of these movies. So um, here, remember, these are two different movies here that are both taking place in this kind of airport schema. 
Uh, and what we find is that this part of the brain um, shows a similar sequence of activity patterns in response to these two movies. So when we compare these, we actually find that there's a similar sequence of responses, um, even though, again, these stories are very different. We think this brain region is tracking this kind of event knowledge, right? That people understand what's going on. This is an airport. They are making predictions about what's coming up next, uh, and they're keeping track of where they are in the sequence. Um, and so this is part of the evidence we have that we think the brain has this kind of library of these scripts that you build up over your life. Um, many of these can take a long time to learn. You have to have many experiences to learn these. And then you can activate these to help you understand what's going on. So another thing we did with this data set, this is in collaboration with a student, Rolando, uh, is we asked people later for their memory about the stories we had showed them. And so um, some people, when we asked them for their memories, they had these very detailed kinds of, of memories. They told me, they could tell me exactly who the actors and actresses were. They could say exactly what happened between them and what they said. Um, and other people, when we would ask them, they'd have only a very vague memory of what happened. Um, most people, their memory for these kinds of stories is pretty good overall in the sense that people will usually remember something, but there's a lot of variability across people and how good they are at memory. And so we were in, what we're interested in is, can we um, pick up some kind of pattern in people's medial prefrontal cortex while they're watching these movies and listening to these stories that tell us whether their memories are going to be good or bad later on. And so one of these kind of markers that we found is that if you do a good job of tracking this kind of event schema information, so if you're um, tracking each of these airport scenes, um, that's actually a predictor of that you're going to have detailed memory later on. So people with these recalls that look like the one on the top, these are the ones that showed strong patterns in MPFC that were really specific to the schema of the story. Uh, and people that had less of this activation tended to have less detailed memories. So this is a really interesting result to us because um, we're, we're just looking here at activation for this general schema. So like airport stuff in general, um, there's no reason why just thinking about airports in general should necessarily make you remember more details about this particular story. But we think there's a kind of synergy between these that if you have this kind of script, if you're activating this kind of knowledge that you have about how the, the world is going to unfold, you can use this as a way to try to organize what you're seeing. Um, it allows you to better understand what you're seeing and, and allows you to better access it later on that now you have a kind of system for thinking about what this story was and you can sort of step through it in your mind by knowing these pieces. So in a follow-up experiment, we were interested in seeing whether we could actually um, change the kinds of scripts that people activate, the kinds of event schemas that people activate for a story. So uh, to do this, we had to use a, a different kind of story. So um, with a student in my lab, Alexandra, uh, we wrote this set of stories where there were actually multiple kinds of, of schemas that they'd activate. So I'm going to play the first sentence of one of these stories. Alvira and Senna walked into the restaurant hand in sweaty hand with quite different expectations for the night because Senna, after five years of dating, was going to propose and Alvira had no idea. So this is one of the stories. And so you can see here, this is a restaurant story. So the fact that they're re walking to a restaurant, you have some kind of knowledge about the kinds of things that might happen. Um, but there's another script going on here as well that um, right, you have some expectations about what's going to happen to the relationship between these characters. Um, and so while you're listening to the story, you could be thinking about this restaurant sequence, restaurant related sequence of things that's happening, um, or this marriage proposal set of things that's going to happen. And so as the story is unfolding, there's details that are happening that are relevant to both of these kinds of structures in the story. Um, and so uh, first, one thing we found is that uh, media prefrontal cortex tracks both of these kinds of things simultaneously. So we see that people are activating both of these kinds of knowledge and using them to understand the story. But we, we were really interested in here is we wanted to see whether we could change the way that people organized their memories. Uh, so what we did is some people, we told them to pretend that they are a restaurant critic. We told them that we're going to tell you the story. We're going to ask you later on a bunch of questions about the restaurant. So what food did they order? Did they like it? How was the restaurant decorated? Um, or we told people, pretend you're a wedding planner. We're going to tell you a story about a couple getting engaged. Um, it's going to be your job to make a little display for their wedding of, about what happened in the proposal. Right, so we gave people different frames and different ways of trying to organize a story. Um, and so we found that this kind of framing um, changed a number of things. It changed ways that people's brain responded. Um, another thing this did is change the kind of details that people remembered. So if we um, if we gave them a prime to pay attention to the location, which here is the restaurant, then we found that they remembered more details about restaurant-related things. 
Um, if we gave them a prime to pay attention to the social interaction, which here is the marriage proposal, um, they instead had more detailed memory about these things that were related to that part of the story. Right? So we could actually, um, we could manipulate the kinds of information right, and, the, and the kinds of, of uh, details that people remembered. Um, in addition, we did some analyses looking at the brain and we found that it also changed the kinds of, of patterns that showed up in people's brains depending on these framings. Um, so we really think that activating this kind of knowledge um, changes the way that our memories are formed. So once we can build up this kind of internal knowledge and we can choose to activate it, um, it, can, it determines the way that we structure our memories and the kind of details that we attach to them. So, so far I've shown you that uh, we have this kind of library of learned event scripts that we can deploy to create, uh, that we use to understand narratives and to build memories. Um, and that when we activate these, it's, it's an organizational kind of principle that allows us to create more durable memories that we can access later on. So one thing we were interested in, and this is um, one thing we're currently working on in my lab, is thinking about um, could this give us tools to strategically make memory better? Could we try to come up with ways of activating these kinds of scripts, maybe even in cases where there isn't really a lot of structure in the thing we're trying to memorize? Can we impose some kind of structure on it and, and activate some kind of internal structure that will allow us to actually remember this thing? Um, so part of what we're looking at here is we're actually studying people that compete in memory competitions and looking at the kinds of strategies that they use. Uh, I'm going to show you a video, video here. This is Alex Mullen. This is, uh, he recently won the USA Memory Championship. Uh, what I'm showing here is him memorizing a deck of 52 cards. So he can do this in about 15 seconds. Um, at this point, one of the limitations is just how fast he can move his hands to move these cards. Um, and so what is Alex doing here? So you might think that Alex is maybe just like a savant and this is some kind of incredible feat that he was uh, born with. But um, in fact, he's using a very specific strategy that he's learned and practiced. Um, and the strategy, this is actually an, a, an ancient technique called the method of loci. Um, and the strategy is that you ahead of time come up with a particular kind of mental map to use for your memories. So this could be an event script, uh, it's often could be a spatial map, so an imagined walk through some kind of space, sequence of spatial locations. Um, and then you use this as a way to organize something that you're trying to remember. So just to give you an example, um, so you can imagine I'm presenting you with a sequence of words. Um, so we do studies like this where we show people a list of random words. You see each word for a few seconds, um, and then we take the words away and ask how many you can remember. Um, and so with, with four that I did there, it's not too bad, but if we give people about 40 of these, this is a really hard task. People maybe get five or 10 of them. Um, and so if we're using this strategy, the idea is that we can try to take these words and we can try to connect them to a script that we already have and know. So for example, if we wanted to use our restaurant script, we could think about this sequence of events that we know happens at restaurants. At first we go into the restaurant and so we could try to pair up this information with the script. So maybe what we want to imagine, we're going to imagine a restaurant, this restaurant's hidden behind this beautiful waterfall. You can like try to hear the water coming down and there's a little condensation on the chair. Um, we see a patron go into the restaurant here. Uh, this is a very tiny patron, it's a mouse. Um, he's sitting on the, the table. Uh, it's, kind of, it's got its nose in the air, like sniffing around. Um, the mouse tries to order, but this huge wind comes. It just blows the menu everywhere. It's like blowing out into the waterfall. Um, Finally, the mouse is able to order, the, the food comes, and the, the food is so tiny that you need a microscope to look at it. It's just so minuscule, um, right? So the idea is you build up some kind of story like this, and now when you want to remember the sequence, we instead think, okay, this is a restaurant story, um, right? What happens when I look at the restaurant? What do I see? Who's seated at the table? What happens when they try to order, right? And so this provides a kind of structure for organizing our memories and replaying them. Um, and so we've been, uh, we've been studying this kind of process. This is um, through this NSF-funded collaboration, which is between Columbia, uh, Princeton University, Rutgers, and M MIT. Um, and so we've been, been trying to understand how these experts use this kind of strategy. We've also been training people to use this. So we've been recruiting people from the New York area uh, to train them in using this technique. And we find that after a couple of weeks of training, people can memorize 40 words almost perfectly in a list. Um, to give you some idea of the, the analyses that we're doing, we can do things like um, try to get a, a picture of what your brain looks like when you're at each of these locations along your map. And then as you're doing this recall process, we can try to see to what extent do you go back through these locations. So we can actually measure in individuals how good of a job are they doing at going back through their sequence of these loci along their script. Um, and so we can get measures for individuals of how good they're doing at this. 
Um, we find in general that the regions that are really involved in getting you along this path, um, first of all, is medial prefrontal cortex that I've, I've talked about already, which we think is really important for maintaining this kind of script information. Um, people are also using regions involved in imagining spatial navigation as well as visual imagery as they're creating these, this sort of imagined narrative. Um, so we think that we can help understand the way that we could build strong memories and retrieve them later by using these kinds of script-based strategies. And so there's lots of ideas here too about um, ways that this could be useful either for um, particular situations where people need to remember things um, or as a kind of, of intervention in cases where um, people are, are need to remember particular pieces of information um, and what are the ways that this could, strategy could be useful for them. Uh, great, with that I'd like to uh, thank the current and past members of my lab and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldassano. Uh, if you have a question, please remember to use the Q&A button, and we'll get to the questions after the second talk. And so now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Jennifer Manley, who is a neuroscientist investigating the life course influences on cognition in older adults. Dr. Manley is a professor of neuropsychology in the Department of Neurology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Her research focuses on mechanisms of inequalities in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease. Her research team has partnered with the Black and Latinx communities in New York City and around the United States to design and carry out investigations of structural and social forces across the life course, such as educational opportunities, discrimination, and socioeconomic inequality, and how these factors relate to cognition and brain health later in life. Her research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and the Alzheimer's Association, and she has authored over 300 peer-reviewed publications in 10 chapters. She was the 2014 recipient of the Tony Wong Diversity Award for Outstanding Mentorship, was the recipient of the Paul Satz International Neuropsychological Society Career Mentoring Award in 2020, and was named the Irving Institute for Clinical and Translational Research Senior Mentor of the Year in 2022. Dr. Manley was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2021. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Manley to the stage. Thanks very much. I am so excited to be here and to have this audience as well. And you'll find out why in, in a couple of minutes, why I'm so excited. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the social and structural influences um, that uh, can shape uh, how we, uh, how our brain ages and, um, uh, you know, some of the differences in uh, how people age uh, over, over the course um, of, of, their, of their older adulthood. So um, one of the uh, things that we're going to be facing um, quite a bit in coming years because of the aging of the population, not just here in the US, but in low and middle income countries all over the world as well is, uh, is a higher rates of dementia. Um, and uh, we want to be able to uh, reduce uh, the number of people and the burden um, associated with dementia, which is not just memory impairment or cognitive impairment, but also impairment in everyday uh, functions of everyday living. So what we do know is that there's all, all of these disparities or differences in um, who is at higher risk or lower risk for developing dementia. And as it turns out, a lot of those causes um, happen throughout the life course, starting um, in, in uh, childhood, early adulthood, um, but, but are also very different depending on um, what the factor is. So uh, this green cir circle up on top um, that represents risks for later life dementia that are experienced early in life is education, low education. It's one of the most uh, you know, resilient, consistent um, associations with risk for having dementia later in life is not having the opportunity to achieve high uh, um, number of years of education. Um, and so these are seen as modifiable risks, um, whether it's education, hearing loss, smoking, depression, or social isolation, 
All of these risk factors can be mitigated throughout life, the lifetime. Some people um, uh, don't, don't suffer from these um, disorders as much as others. These um, disparities uh, then are modifiable. And um, the, at the end of the day, what this figure uh, shows is that 42% of the prevalence of dementia is actually modifiable. So that's a great deal that we can do to preserve cognitive health. Um, those data that I showed you just now in that figure are um, almost all based on white, well-educated uh, European ancestry people. And um, so what we don't have a lot of in the literature um, is evidence about what we can do to prevent cognitive decline, uh, memory decline, and dementia in uh, people from minoritized groups. So um, I'm showing you just uh, some results of a study that's been going on in Washington Heights um, here in New York City for many, many years, the, the Washington Heights Inwood Columbia Aging Project. It's studied over 6,500 older adults that were picked um, essentially randomly from the community. And that's important because people who volunteer for a memory study, people who um, are, you know, even patients in a, in a specialized me memory clinic, they are very different from people who don't volunteer for memory studies or who don't have access to healthcare. And those same people are more vulnerable to uh, dementia and cognitive decline. So we need to have a target sort of basic basis uh, uh, of our population that is everyone. So what the YCAP study did was defined a neighborhood and said everyone that's age 65 years and older in this neighborhood, we want to invite you to be in a longitudinal study of memory and cognition over time. And some of the key findings there was first that um, there were disparities in uh, memory impairment and dementia across racial and ethnic groups. So African Americans and uh, uh, Latinx um, older adults were more likely to have dementia at every age. Um, but we also found um, that things like uh, literacy and educational experience um, were protective. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. I did want to share with you uh, quickly that um, uh, you heard um, uh, Chris talk about uh, uh, memory tests that, that he's developing in his lab. We give similar tests, so that word list um, that he showed you um, that, that then taught you some uh, nice strategies for remembering it. We give older adults a list of 10 words uh, and then, you know, uh, give it to them in several trials and then ask them to tell uh, it back to us after delay. We also use story memory. Um, uh, as, a, as a measure of, uh, another kind of measure of, um, of memory, and visual memory. So we give people figures, we show them figures, and ask them to draw them um, after we take the figure away. So we're trying to measure memory in several different ways. Um, I just want to tell you that uh, what we know about how the brain ages, some of the neuropathologies, um, uh, that can be picked up uh, using biomarkers, whether they are in neuroimaging, or in plasma or in PET scans, uh, these have um, these are downstream. This is what you see, what the doctor would see when they go into when a person goes into the hospital or they do neuroimaging. But um, what's uh, a little bit more upstream or uh, you know earlier on in the life course, you can see that there are risk factors that can put people at higher or lower risk for having those neuro different uh, uh, levels of neuropathology. Um, you can see that race and ethnicity now is something that can be taken into account um, uh, just at, at, this, at this very superficial level um, uh, when, when people present with uh, chronic diseases. But all of these have social and structural determinants that underlie the risk factors for these um, diseases. And so you can see those are early life social um, uh, and structural risk factors or later life social and structural risk factors. And those, even in themselves, you know, you, you now hear a lot of lingo about social determinants of health. Those have causes. Those causes are disparities or inequalities in power, in institutional power, um, and forces like racism, sexism, ableism. 
And those forces um, then create inequalities for certain groups. And I just want to point out that one of the uh, sources of institutional power in this country and, in, and across the world is schools. Schools impart um, privilege or can, uh, uh, can take it away if it's not available or if it's more stressful for some people to attend school. So we're going to talk about that um, more now. Um, I just want to say that that there are people with a lot of neuropathology in their brain, but they do not present as having cognitive impairment. And what we found is that one of the most powerful predictors of whether you will present with cognitive impairment despite having a, a, a neuropathology in the brain is schooling. And so there's something very protective about schooling that we need to understand more about. And so I um, have asked the question in the older adults that I study in Washington Heights, why does schooling matter for brain health? And this is a picture of um, a school on the left in the Dominican Republic and a school on the right in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Arkansas. They are one room schools. Um, the one in Arkansas is an all black school in uh, 1930s. And so when you think about, you know, the, the schooling that our, uh, our elders, our older adults uh, in our family attended, they are not only very different, obviously, from the schools that we attend today, but, um, you know, they were very segregated in many cases, um, rural, not well, not well uh, funded. And this actually has an effect on cognition over time. So um, what, one thing that uh, we were able to show in our, in our group, this is Miguel Arce and Gloria Felix, is that um, people who had, uh, despite having no formal education, all of the people in the study had no formal education, the people who knew how to read and write were less likely to develop dementia over time. That's that green line um, in the survival curve. They were less likely uh, to get dementia at any age as they got older. We also have been doing MRI scans downstairs in this building. And uh, we do structural MRI, not functional MRI. And one of the measures you can get out of that is cortical thickness. What um, my postdoc, uh, uh, Justina Avila-Rieger, found was that um, if you look in the upper left corner there, those are um, white people. And the, the three lines are people with high education, uh, average education, and the lowest line is low education. And um, going from left to right, people on the left side of that graph where it's really spread out have um, a lot of cortical thinning, right? So their brain, the cortical um, area of their brain is not as thick as it should be. But the highest line there, um, uh, that, that highest line of people with the highest level of, of education, they, um, their cognitive function remains within normal limits even though um, they have a lot of cortical thinning, whereas the people with low education, there seems to be a dip, right? And uh, they're very vulnerable to that, uh, that cognitive or that cortical thinning. The other two uh, squares, the middle one and the right on the top, are black individuals and Latinx individuals. So you can see there's not that protective effect of education in their case. There's not that, uh, there's not that um, uh, um, sort of cognitive reserve that's imparted by um, the educational benefits. We've also looked at um, dementia uh, prevalence and also cognitive decline over time as it relates to birth year. So because we've done such a large group of studies um, and recruited people over time, we're able to study people at the same age but just differed by, differ them by the year they were born. And what um, uh, Yetvonk found um, was that people who were born earlier had more rapid uh, memory decline than people who were born later. When you account for changes in compulsory school laws um, in, this, in the United States, th that accounts for these differences. So uh, asking people to uh, have more education um, was actually accounting for this uh, secular change in, um, in dementia. They've also found that in Europe, 
This is just a really cool design. They're showing the year that they changed the laws and, and sort of made people attend more years of school. There was a bump up in uh, executive function um, in, those, those, um, in those European um, countries. We've also done this on a national level to look at policy changes in educational experience. Um, and through old records, the biennial surveys on education, we're able to look at length of school year, student teacher ratio, percent to attendance in schools. Um, this graph shows the disparities across state in the number of days that schools were open in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and also the student teacher ratio. And uh, those, um, uh, when you put all of those indicators together, you see that there are very big state differences in how much investment there was in these elementary schools and also um, across race. And essentially what this is showing is that uh, among almost 20,000 people in the, the US, higher investment in an elementary school was associated with lower risk of cognitive impairment later in life. And that effect was strongest in white people, especially white women. Um, the benefit of that higher school quality was much lower among black people in general, especially black men. And we think that that's racism in schools or the labor market that's sort of reducing the returns to education in that group. What I wanted to just flash by you here is just to think about, it's not just number of years of school or quality of school. There could be benefits of school for the neighborhood. There could be benefits on the individual, not sort of what's going on in the classroom, but also what their peers are doing. So now they're networking with peers who are better educated. There could also be um, an impact um, uh, you know, through uh, um, things like uh, prestige. So even though you may not learn a thing, if you have a degree, that may increase your prestige in the uh, society and um, uh, uh, better your, your later life health. So one of the best ways to think about that are these uh, studies that have recruited people when they were in high school and followed them over time. Project Talent is just one of those studies recruited uh, almost over 300,000 people when they were in high school in 1960. And in 2018, we tracked a lot of them down and did memory testing over the phone. And uh, this shows the design for that study. Um, and uh, basically, I wanna share with you what we found. I'm so excited to share with you teachers what we found, um, which is that, um, uh, attending schools with a higher number of teachers with graduate training was the clearest predictor of later life cognition later uh, when people were over age 65. School quality mattered especially for language abilities and also teacher salary and school size had a larger impact on women uh, in the study instead of men. We know that black respondents were disproportionately exposed to low quality schools but these effects had an equal impact on the uh, black students as, as they did on the white students. So improving these aspects of teacher education, of teacher salary um, are, are really uh, promising for, uh, for improving later life brain health. One of uh, the other studies I'm working on now is, is uh, looking at STEM uh, uh, courses and how exposure to STEM courses in high school benefits later life. I don't know if you know this, but it's one of the best predictors of income as people get older is whether they were exposed to STEM courses during high school. Um, and that's outside of the number of years of school that they ultimately um, attain. And that does seem to be tracking with respect to cognitive health as well. So um, in summary, uh, when the, the level of cognition that we enter into older age with, the, the level of memory that we enter into older age with is, is, is a very important piece of extending um, our cognitive life expectancy, expectancy. A lot of the policies that are seen as sort of economic policies are actually brain health policies. And so uh, policies that repair intergenerational effects of racism, that invest in schools and teachers to increase school quality, or to provide um, funding for uh, neighborhood inequalities can help extend um, our, our cognitive brain health. And then finally, um, I think you all as teachers have 
um, uh, uh, you know, part of, the, of this is your role to uh, improve the leadership uh, by scientists, future scientists that have not traditionally been included in dementia research. And with that, thanks very much. And I thank my team and funders. Thank you so much, Dr. Manley. Uh, okay, now I'll invite Dr. Baldassano to the stage and uh, to join us for a discussion and we'll answer some of your questions. So I'm going to take questions from our online audience and from our in-person audience and we're going to switch back and forth. And so we're going to try to prioritize students and teachers. Of course, everyone raise your hands, but students and teachers, we for sure, we want to hear from you. Ooh. And um, for the in-person audience, when we get to you, just raise your hand and somebody with a microphone will come over to you for the questions. And so um, I'd actually like to start our discussion tonight with a topic that came in a few times online because people were able to send in their questions ahead of time before they heard you talk tonight. So this is kind of just what they got from the description. And there was a lot of interest in aging well, specifically in regards to learning and memory. And the questions mostly fell along two paths. And those were, what can we do while we are young? And the example was in our 20s uh, to help us have good brain health when we are older. And also, what can we do when we're older to try to uh, maintain or improve learning and memory? All right. Uh, I think it will be no surprise to you that if you're in your early 20s, you should be in college. Um, <laughs> no, I think um, that um, the, the, the key uh, part that we're understanding about, about uh, early life and adolescence and young adulthood is that um, opportunities for uh, advancement are key. We, you know, I've, I've presented um, a number of different associations at the population level that are important for, you know, public health uh, and maintaining um, brain aging. But um, when you look back at different educational pathways, for example, there are a lot of different ways people could go. Um, I think that um, as we get more data, we're recognizing that people may not attain their uh, degrees at the same, everyone at the same age, but that it is in fact the process of getting the degree that is important. Um, we're also recognizing, I think, that, um, that, that the experience of schooling can be stressful um, for some uh, for students if they're exposed, if they're more likely to be exposed to racism in those schools. So there's a lot of dialogue about segregated schooling versus integrated schooling, especially you know, here in New York, we have more, you know, the schools are almost as segregated in a way uh, as they were back in uh, when our, when, when, you know, our grandparents were, were going to school. Um, so, so uh, you know, I think we have to, um, you know, for, for that 20 year old, um, uh, you know, uh, stressing out and making sure you get into Harvard or something like that isn't necessarily the answer. Um, the answer is that, um, you know, exposing yourself to um, social and uh, learning environments that will ultimately, um, you know, bring you, bring you, uh, joy <laughs> is, is probably uh, the best way to, to spend your 20s. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's the whole other um, sort of uh, 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 emphasis on physical uh, activity and, uh, uh, and on um, environmental uh, exposures. Um, and, you know, so, so I think staying healthy 
uh, as, as healthy as you can in your environment is, is, always, is always good advice. Yeah, that, that was great. Yeah, maybe one thing to add on the end there too about for yeah, exercise that for um, many of the kinds of interventions that we try to do in things like memory, um, it can be hard to beat the intervention of like having people take a little bit of a walk every day. Um, that, that's actually quite a good baseline if you're looking for something simple and, and pretty free to do. Um, but yeah, so there, there's lots of interesting questions too from um, the studying uh, the, these functional properties of the brain of things that change with aging that, um, you know, as I mentioned, when people are building these memories, there's, a, you're combining the specific things that are happening right now with your internal knowledge. And as people get older, that balance tends to change, that you tend to rely more on this knowledge that you have about the world, which in many ways makes a lot of sense. Um, if you have more experience, you should rely on that more. Um, and so the, the kinds of things that are easy and difficult can also change over time as well. And so um, some of it is not necessarily about being worse. It's about that there's different strategies that people use. Um, and yeah, and we think there's opportunities for people to improve their memories at all different ages. So this study I mentioned of teaching people to use this method of loci technique, um, we intentionally tried to not do it with just undergraduate students at Columbia. And so uh, we did sample from people in the community up um, into these people up like 20s up into 60s and um, that it's people seem pretty successful at, at using these kinds of techniques. Um, so maybe that probably less of an intervention for when we're talking about things like clinical um, kinds of Alzheimer's or dementia, but just in terms of, of aging, um, I think these are strategies that anybody can use. Thank you. So in answer to the questions that were sent in before, try to enjoy your time in school, enjoy your intellectual <laughs> curiosity. Um, and we learned some cool techniques to improve our memory and also go for a walk because the data keeps telling us that we're supposed to move. And it's especially important for walking. Um, oh, so now we can go to the audience. So, oh, we have a bunch of questions. Who has the mic? Who, uh, so we can go in the front first. We'll start in the front. Columbia University sweatshirt, please. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Joseph. I wanted to, before I ask anything, uh, thank you for the presentations. It really is so inspiring. Um, I've played uh, cello and meditation since I was younger and some of my volunteer work these past few years, ever since the pandemic restrictions were lifted, was with doing this music and meditation workshop at underserved communities in, in New York City, like Harlem, Brooklyn. So Dr. Manley, your, re your research is really so inspiring. Uh, so then I have an, a question to address to Dr. Balsano, actually. Um, about the event scripts and event structure, like all the research you do with like continuous uh, narrative perception and whatnot, uh, I wanted to ask what implications could that have into emotions and our emotional experiences? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. This is something I'm really interested in is like, um, these kinds of experiences that we have that are spread out over time, which is often not the way that we study things in psychology. Usually we sort of flash individual, you know, words or things that people, um, or so if we're gonna study emotion, we'd like show people a face looking scared and then show people a face looking happy. And so I'm really interested in more of these natural kind of dynamics over time. Yes. And so, yeah, one way we've been looking at actually is using music, like you mentioned as well, that um, thinking about, uh, so we, we actually worked with composers at NYU to create this music that has a sort of predictable structure to it that people can learn. Um, and then it also had this sort of sequence of emotions that it was conveyed in the music to take people through. Um, and so, yeah, so we think this taps into a lot of these same systems that we use for narrative memory. Um, it's maybe a, a reason that that emotion that can be conveyed through music in this way is that it taps into the same kind of systems. Yeah. Um, and so it informs a lot of these memories as well. So yeah, that's a, it's a really a pretty under explored direction at all thinking about this for um, these more continuous kinds of stimuli. Um, but yeah, there's lots of interesting things there that that are really hard to get at with isolated kind of punctate um, yeah. things that we usually do and looking at things like, for example, if we put people in a really negative emotional state, that's harder to pull people out of than going positive to negative. And so um, there's interesting things there too about the, the way people form these and the way that they remember their experiences later. Also, could I just ask a quick follow-up or should I move on? Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned a lot about the medial prefrontal cortex. How do you think maybe that could be like reflected um, downstream or around to like the hippocampus and then the amygdaloid complex, especially with emotion? I'm not sure how that would be reflected in fMRI stuff, but. Just in general. Yeah, that's right. So um, yeah, there's a lot of complicated questions here. Yeah, about yeah, the, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the neuroscience of this. So the um, we usually think of the hippocampus as yeah, a really important structure for remembering particular events that have happened to you. And so the hippocampus works in conjunction with 
these regions like the MPFC that are tracking this sort of general knowledge that stretches across many episodes. Um, and they're both also related to things like the amygdala, which is tracking sort of emotional content and memories and tagging memories with emotional content. Um, and so, yeah, there's lots of interesting questions there. We're actually doing some studies right now uh, in collaboration with Nim, Dr. Nim Tottenham here at, at Columbia, who looks at um, development emotional regulation in kids and thinking about how children respond and to experiences, form emotional memories for those experiences, how it relates to the particular things that they've learned from their lives. So kids that have had different kinds of experiences growing up, how does that change the way that they form these memories for, for new experiences? Thank you so much. Thanks. So we're gonna go back to our online audience and then we'll go back to the in-person audience. Uh, and we have so many great questions coming in. Oh, here's a really interesting one. Okay, so let's do this one. I know that scent can be connected to memory because smell is processed differently than our other senses. And smell can help retrieve memories. Um, but what happens when you can no longer smell, which happens to many older adults, or even after COVID, I guess, because we have to bring up COVID, uh, do you lose ability to access and restructure personal memories? This is kind of a philosophical question for the two uh, of you. <laughs> I, 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 I think the, the way, the last part, um, I think I can say that people who lose the sense of cell, smell don't lose the ability to access um, memories or to lay down memories. But there is, uh, there are a lot of, at the, at the uh, epi, uh, epidemiologic level, a lot of studies that are showing that as uh, people lose their sense of smell, they are simultaneously often losing their memory. So that has spurned on a lot of studies of looking at smell or you know, odor identification as an early biomarker for Alzheimer's disease because the uh, areas of the brain that are responsible for that odor identification um, could be among the first to be affected by the, neuro the neuropathology, the amyloid, uh, or the tau that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, um, I will just say, just just because I can't help it, but there is a really exciting new study on hearing, actually, um, called the Achieve that was trial. actually one of the other online questions. So oh, I'm glad you're going okay. in this direction. Go um, for which it. Which is another sort of, you know, uh, uh, sensory uh, domain. And what they did was they took uh, older adults and randomized them to getting high quality hearing aids. Um, these people weren't necessarily complaining of memory problems. They were just, um, you know, community residents. And what they found in uh, 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 people who were more representative of uh, the, the, the U.S., so not those volunteers, um, but the population um, representative folks, was that even, uh, uh, even if they weren't already on the path to get dementia, if they were randomized to getting a hearing aid, they were able to maintain their memory and cognition better over time. That was a significant, sort of statistically significant effect. But the thing that was most um, uh, remarkable about that study is how much people loved having their hearing aids. They just loved being able to get back into whatever social, um, you know, physical, and uh, you know, the environments that that were painful or not very fun for them. You know, we had a restaurant scene. You can imagine. Uh, not being able to carry on a conversation in a restaurant setting. And because these were high quality hearing aids, um, they were, um, you know, tuned especially for them. They didn't have that annoying, you know, hissing sound. They were really, really great um, uh, quality hearing aids that they were randomized to. Um, that was a very um, uh, sort of the strongest effect of the study. And it could be that their improvement in memory and cognition was through that mechanism of just better well-being and like being more social and being more uh, less less depressed or less socially isolated. Hmm. That that was I'm so glad you went in that direction because I also love that study and also so many people online and in the audience they're really interested in knowing what they can do to kind of help protect themselves yeah. from Alzheimer's disease. 
And so a hearing aid, so if you have a loved one who's resistant to getting that hearing aid, now you can tell them. But neuroscience <laughs> says that it's good for you. Let, let me just bring it to a policy level, which is that hearing aids, if those of you who've tried to get a hearing aid for an older adult, they're not covered by Medicare, which is absolutely uh, you know, such a big problem. And then getting these high quality hearing aids, it's expensive. So this is really very much a, uh, you know, something that, that derives from this, that, that whole process that I talked to you about, the social and structural determinants of health, those that can afford um, the better hearing aids are then better protected at a time when um, that, that can be very effective. So um, now we can advocate, right? We can advocate for um, higher quality health care and, and things like better quality hearing aids for older adults that are covered. So when we all go home tonight, we're going to write into our government officials and say <laughs> neuroscience requires that we make this affordable for everybody. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the audience. Uh, green jacket. Hi. So this is um, an observation I made during, we did two memory tests. So my question is about the memory tests. Um, so the first memory test, like somewhere in my life, I had a belief that I've learned that I have a good memory. So the first time I was like, I got this, I'm doing this, and I got 100. Second time I was like, yeah, I don't care. Maybe I'll get it right. Then I was thinking about like, well, if someone asked me to test my running, you know, I have asthma, uh, shortness of breath. I would be like, I don't really care to run the fastest. So I wouldn't do my best ability unless like someone was like, I will murder you if you don't run fast right so anyway does this like internal belief system and i guess societal we have like internalized racism sexism and all of it does that maybe affect the way the outcome of the memory test is like do people like certain people take the memory memory test and like i actually don't care and i was thinking like for my students like it's really us we teachers struggle with like buy-in it's like okay we're doing this assignment and then you know i'm like and then I'm grading it, so then all of a sudden they start writing, or, oh, there's a prize, there's candy, oh, we're going to start writing it. So I guess, it, are the people in the study like 100% motivated, and does their internalized belief system affect the results, and is there like a control or something to counteract that? Yeah, that's a great question. I can, I can tell you definitely, we, you know, we run a lot of our, our studies, um, yeah, just with undergrads that are signing up, many of them are actually required to do studies as part of their classes. And so the level of buy-in varies a lot <laughs> in terms of how hard they want to try. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think one of the, the lessons from this, um, what we've learned about how you form memories is that you really, um, the more active that you are in sort of like trying to use strategies or trying to think deeply about the things you're remembering, it makes an enormous difference in, in how um, you do. And so um, it is a challenge with a lot of these tasks, the tasks, a lot of the traditional tasks with these like wordless tasks are really hard and people may not care about them. Um, it's one reason that my lab does really like using things like stories and movies is people are much more willing to watch a movie. Um, it's also sort of uh, can expand to other populations and maybe have more difficulty attending to things, can still watch a movie. We actually are able to, we through collaborations, we do this all the way down to three month olds that will, are willing to watch movies. And so um, using tools that we think where people are actually going to be engaging these memory processes is really important. Um, for some of these studies, it, it's like interesting to us to see people that are trying harder or not trying harder because it actually lets us see something about what it looks like in your brain when you're trying hard and that maybe helps us learn things. Um, but yeah, this sort of like um, giving people a way that they uh, are going to enjoy the task or yeah, or um, want to remember the things in the task um, can matter a lot. And so, um, you know, it's, it's one thing that changes too as we give people like strategies for what they can do in these word lists suddenly becomes a little bit more of a game of like, can I figure this out? Um, there's, it, there's also a creativity aspect to it of you need to figure out a way to like relate these items to this script that we've given you. Um, people come up with very interesting creative ways of doing this. And so um, building in opportunities for it to be sort of engaging and fun, even if you're not changing the material at all, right, could make it a lot easier to remember. I'll just quickly add that I like your question because the overall, um, you know, thing that you're referring to is sort of the cultural expectations um, and just the expectations in general that people enter into this room, right? It can be a strange room because there's a person sitting there who's got a piece of paper in front of them and they're going <laughs> to give you a list of words or a story you've never heard before. 
Um, so there are, are a lot of cultural expectations embedded in this whole thing, this whole, you know, neuropsychology, psychology process where we assess people. And we shouldn't take anything for granted. There are a lot of assumptions that we've made because we've only tested certain people over time. And when we apply it differently, we learn a lot. Um, just as a clinical um, neuropsychologist, when people come in because there's a worry about their memory or about their function, I can tell you there's kind of like a you know, upside down U-shaped curve, or actually it is a U-shaped curve, right? So people who are more relaxed, um, uh, uh, you know, too relaxed, they don't do that well. Yeah, it is upside down. I don't know what, what, what order the U is, but the people who are relaxed, they may not do so well, the people who really don't care. And then the people who are super anxious and like really, really want to do really, really well, like they start getting distracted. And I, I need that sweet spot, right? Not so relaxed that you don't care, not so uptight that you're distracted by the thoughts that um, you might do badly. Um, and so what we do over time is build rapport with people clinically. And we also do that in the research setting. I will say that because of experiences of, of discrimination that are fueled by real uh, uh, episodes of, of racism in, in, in the world, um, there is something called stereotype threat that, that can actually distract people from the task at hand. Um, and especially if they are uh, worrying about a stereotype about their group. So if, you're, if you hype people up and tell them that what they're, what they're getting is a ability test, their performance, if they're, if they're uh, uh, racialized as black, can be lower than if you tell them it's a fun game. Um, so that's sort of um, the, the last talk like this I was at. It was uh, one of the uh, um, professors in the psychology department was talking about um, attribution and, and uh, stereotype threat. Yeah, that was a great question. And it actually also reminded me of a course that I took at the New York Academy of Sciences because when we get our PhD in science, they don't necessarily teach us how to teach, but then we're supposed to go out there and teach undergraduate students. And so there's this course called Scientists Teaching Science. And one of the studies that they had us read there was that when students were told that something was really hard, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy and they tended to do worse. And so it's better just to say, this is what it is, or I, I feel confident that you can do it, or if it really is going to be hard, maybe don't say that, maybe just say this is going to require a nice amount of your time. So, and it kind of reminded me of the of this Garfield cartoon that was in my physics classroom that said, it's not your IQ, it's your I will. And so that comforted me in physics class. Also, I loved Garfield. Um, so, so all of that, all of that was working for me. So we're gonna go back to the online questions and let's see. Oh, this is a nice one. Uh, why are certain age groups and races more likely to, de to develop Alzheimer's disease? And this comes from one of our high school students in the audience. Okay. Well, that's um, sort of my life's work. We don't know everything <laughs> ab about it yet. But, you know, any disparities in health, whether it be uh, um, blood pressure or diabetes um, or uh, heart disease, they all have these social and structural uh, um, uh, causes, right? So um, when, when the, the question is asked, why are there racial differences in this and that, it's not um, because there's something about skin color or ancestry or anything like that that's causing um, the, these biological processes. Um, these racial groups are um, sort of made into biology through uh, disparities in uh, resources, in, uh, in um, uh, stigma in uh, privilege and access. So that, that's the, the reason. Now, how, is, how can we interrupt that? Are there key times during life that we can intervene to uh, narrow those disparities? Are there things like reparations that could narrow those disparities? Um, are there uh, you know, healthcare interventions that would be able to um, narrow those disparities. So that, that's the study of mechanisms. The point I was trying to make is that 
these mechanisms have a long arm way back into childhood. And uh, what we found, I hope I showed you some convincing evidence that at least educational experience, both you know, uh, access to uh, more education, but also the quality of that education and STEM courses, right, um, uh, will uh, uh, ultimately have benefits and narrow disparities later in life. Thank you. Uh, oh, I can't go to online. I have to go to you guys. Okay, you guys. <laughs> so let's go to the other side of the room and we'll do white shirt. Good evening. Uh, thank you again for, for your lectures. These were, this is incredible. Just I, I'm obsessed with memory, so this was so much fun to, to hear and learn about. Um, I, I, I do want to pivot just a little bit. Uh, I've been a special educator for 13 years, and I am uh, really fascinated by the autistic mind. And um, I read this book, Born on a Blue Day, by Daniel Tammet, who is autistic as, and also has synesthesia. And he set a world record for memorizing 20,000 plus digits of pi. Do you have you have you studied or have you considered studying neurodiverse uh, persons, um, particularly those with photographic memory or synesthesia? Because I'm I'm just I have no idea how it could possibly happen, and it's it's so just amazing to me. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So definitely on the synesthesia angle, um, there are for the people that compete in these competitions, there is a very high rate of synesthesia among these people, and so um, this is right. People aren't familiar with this. So this is people that have sort of like cross sensory kinds of experiences where uh, particular numbers will always be associated with particular sort of colors or emotions or something like this. And so, um, you know, I think this is part of that that piece of it. At least we sort of understand why this would help, which is that you're adding on all of these extra kind of distinctive features to your memory that make it a lot easier to find later on. And so, um, anybody could add these kinds of features. It just might it'll take a lot more effort if you don't have this sort of natural synesthesia, right? Um, yeah, for questions more about um, sort of looking at neurodiverse populations and autism and things, yeah, I, I think we, we know a lot less there about those mechanisms. So at least some of them probably are differences in the ways that memories are encoded in the hippocampus and the way that they're sort of pruned later on, that um, there's a lot of, in sort of neurotypical populations, there's a lot of processes that cause forgetting over time that um, could potentially be supporting some kinds of, of functions. And so it's possible that there's actually, there's some like balance between these processes that um, could be different in different populations. Um, and so there, there's also a lot of interesting questions too about uh, one of the main things we study in my lab is prediction, is how you use this knowledge to make predictions about the future. Um, there's at least some evidence that that prediction process specifically is actually something that um, in autism is, is sort of specifically reduced, which is this ability to make predictions, which is um, part of also what makes things of social interactions more challenging. Um, and so again, it might be there, again, might be some sort of trade off between sort of paying attention to what's in the moment versus what is going to come up next. And so um, if you're really in the moment uh, and you, maybe you're, you're worse at predicting, but better at memory encoding or something. And so, um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of cool questions there we don't know the answer to. So we are just about out of time. Uh, and so I was going through some of the, some of the online questions and I'm going to try to distill it into one final question for you guys. <laughs> and so we started off with kind of talking about what we can do to make sure that we're okay when we're older. Uh, but we also have a lot of teachers in the audience and they're, they're really interested in what they can do for their students now to improve learning and memory. And so from the research that the both of you are doing, uh, what advice do you have for the teachers in terms of developing lesson plans or or just even conveying information to their classes? Um, yeah, I mean, this is something that I'm sure many of the teachers already know this general principle, but some of the things that I was showing here is that um, it's really difficult to learn new information unless you can attach it to something that you already know. And so, um, right, this sort of a structure of giving a kind of a scaffold, right, giving a a way of organizing information, we know is really important for um, being able to attach these pieces. Um, I mean, one of the other biggest effects of memory research has to do with what we call blocked versus spaced kind of learning, which is that um, if you try to cram information in a short period of time, you'll tend to also forget it in a short period of time. It becomes very difficult to access. And so um, simply coming back to, even if it's the same exact material, coming back to it multiple times, spreading out those times when you're learning things, um, 
creates a much more robust memory that's easier to access later on as well. Um, so those are the, at least those kinds of, those are maybe the, the most basic pieces. We often give these to undergrads as well too, to think about what might be more effective ways of studying for exams. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, building up these, these structures sort of slowly over time is a big piece. Um, maybe one more thing I could say is that uh, we also know there's strong sort of context effects on memory, which is that um, based on what's going on around you when you're learning something, um, that also becomes part of the memory. And so um, this means that creating different kinds of context for learning different things can potentially be useful for sort of forming separate memories for things. And so this could mean learning things in different locations or having different kinds of lighting in the room or right these are all features that um, get encoded in the memory they become kind of the organization of how you access these things later on um, and so we we know that like learning things in different kinds of contexts is also really useful for if you you want to have these kinds of generalized memories um, and so you know again i think for some of the things we study uh, we i usually feel like i'm more likely to go to educators and see what they're doing and try to explain why it works versus being able to give you good advice. But uh, those are at least some of the basic strategies that we that we often uh, try to, to impart on our students here. And I'll just have you recall that some of the um, drivers of our relationships in that Project Talent study was um, teacher uh, teachers, uh, higher education, sort of graduate level training in the subjects that they were teaching and also teacher salary. So the point there is investment in schools, all things that happen in schools, including teachers, um, is, a, is, a, is a strategy uh, to help your students. They have um, adults in, in their life during, during the school day that really care about them and that um, you know, want, want them to succeed. And uh, you know, I think that that, that is, uh, whether the school is serving children who are minoritized or, you know, children who are, are not, um, whether they're a mixed uh, race and ethnicity and language schools, um, whatever, whatever uh, um, you know, the school context is, those types of investments um, have an association with better memory later in life. So that's all the time we have, but thank you all for attending this event. And thanks again to both of our speakers for joining us today. Uh, please take two minutes to fill out the survey, which we will put in the chat. So this is for our online folks. And let us know what you thought about today's event. And we appreciate your feedback. And Dr. Lee will close out our event. All right, really quick. <laughs> Just want to say thank you all for, first of all, attending this event and we couldn't have done it without our talent on the stage. So thank you so much to Dr. Prado, Dr. Baldassano and Dr. Manley for your fantastic and insightful conversation. And we hope you all enjoyed the program. It's our final one of the season. So if you liked it, I hope to see you back here in the fall. And until then, I hope you all be well and increase your memory until next time. <laughs>